protest, uh, like demonstrations and uh, rallies and uh, other kinds of, uh, of uh, clearly audible and conspicuous protest. It's another thing to uh, to uh, maintain a uh, a movement long range, you know, long down the road that uh, that uh, really makes significant progress, that, that does something, that accomplishes something, because uh, uh, you can you can you can state a position, you can take a position and state it. Uh, that's one thing, but uh, to do something that, that makes a long-range difference is, uh, uh, is quite something else. That's where I think private Christian education is, is, the, is the real answer to the problem. Well, this is have. one thing that I feel, you know, in the long run, uh, you're not going to be able to reform these public schools. That's right. That's right. Public, yeah. public education is a disaster. Yeah. Are we on the air now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, of course, this is one thing that I want to try to plug in the book. I'm all for Christian education, right? You know, with no government money involved. And, right, right. Uh, I would like to see, you know, what I would like to see myself is to shut the public school system right down and just go back to private schools. I think you get a better education for kids all the way around. Yeah, I think that's a, that is that is a basic principle. Is the is the approach. That should be taken, and that may be a long time coming. Uh, but but uh, if uh, if education is the basic responsibility of parents, which it is, then whatever kind of education our children have or get must be uh, provided in in terms of a direct response to what parents want for their children. And uh, if, uh, if public education is too bureaucratic, if it's too uh, uh, cumbersome to administer, if it's too anonymous, if it's too unresponsive uh, to, to do this, then we've got to seek an alternative solution. And I see private Christian education is succeeding already quite well this way. I think there's to be an average of one new public school per day in this year right now in the United States, at least that many, coming up. And uh, uh, people all over are, are finding this to be the solution to their problem. Uh, uh, this is a conclusion that we have arrived at here uh, after having been involved, after 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 attempting as uh, as uh, citizens and taxpayers and parents in a community in what we thought was a, or what we think like to think is a free society, uh, our taxes are paying for it, uh, um, and uh, uh, a system uh, like this is supposed to be responsive to the people paying for it and for the people who provide the children for it. And we have uh, experienced uh, obstinacy, arrogance, uh, total unresponsive uh, reaction from the Board of Education. And uh, so uh, many people can say, well, yes, uh, we're paying for it, and we have a right uh, to, to have it, and that's all very true. But meanwhile, until we get, and until one way or the other we're able to get a response uh, that's appropriate, uh, meanwhile, we have our children, and we cannot, uh, we can't, uh, we can't leave our children in the hands of uh, of uh, progressive educators while we're seeking uh, slowly a solution to the problem. Is there anything that you could comment on as far as the books themselves? The yeah, well, the books. Thoughts. Observations okay. of them. I've seen excerpts out of them in there. Uh, have you seen Mr. Fike's? Uh, uh, the I mean the that, big uh, news. Yeah, 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 I have. Well, that's that rather typifies, but the, uh, there are other things there too. That I mean, there are things in the in the books that are too, uh, uh, I guess, uh, involved to to get into any kind of a single.
fire or advertisement like that, but that, that in part at least does uh, demonstrate the problem. Well, on the books, my uh, uh, I, that brings me to the place where I first became involved in the controversy. Uh, the books, as we see them here, essentially the issue they are part of the of the deeper issue the books uh, are the things uh, the thing that uh, uh, that uh, came to the surface here this was the uh, that part of the basic problem that came to the attention of our community because uh, it was something uh, as it turned out in our situation, it was something that uh, people could uh, clearly see and focus their attention on and perceive uh, as, uh, as something that was uh, clearly and specifically objectionable. And uh, uh, as we began to seek a solution to books that were objectionable, uh, it became very obvious that uh, this was only the smallest tip of the iceberg, uh, that the books uh, emanated from a, uh, a deeper, more essential problem, uh, namely the problem of progressive education. Which the books are the symptom of the... Yeah, books are, in other words, there are many unwholesome symptoms of progressive education, of which the books are only one. Yeah, right. In other words, there's uh, there is uh, not only the books. In other words, the books per se, as far as the content of the books. But of course, these books reflect a philosophy. These books reflect a, an, an approach to education. Uh, and uh, in other words, they pr they reflect a method of teaching. They reflect a philosophy toward education. And they also reflect some very unwholesome uh, 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 psychological, social, moral, spiritual uh, uh, philosophies. And uh, in other words, because in these books not only are four-letter words, uh, unwholesome, obscene, profane language, in these books also you find uh, uh, advocated uh, the concept of uh, permissiveness, uh, of rebellion, of disdain for authority, of, uh, of uh, uh, deprecation of our uh, basic institutions, of, of uh, the basic American traditions. Uh, you find uh, uh, the glamorization of... Uh, of uh, moral degeneracy, uh, you find uh, 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 basic virtues such as honesty, uh, the, the, the traditional attitudes towards uh, uh, stealing, lying, cheating, uh, all of these other things are left open-ended and in their place, we have substituted situation ethics, which means take, a, take your choice. You know, if it's okay for you, do your own thing. Uh, all of this uh, taught uh, uh, by innuendo and subtlety and suggestion and sometimes by direct precept uh, uh, in this philosophy of education as we found it, uh, as it finds expression in these books. Now, is there some of the material that uh, they use in this that would be in the teacher's manuals 
that would not be, you know, if you just had a set of the books about the right. teacher's manuals. Yeah. Is, yeah. is there some of this that is more or less put forth in the teacher's manuals in such a way that the teacher would actually teach this type of thing? Yeah, this is what I had reference to when I said not only content in the books, but also teaching methods. Because the teacher's manuals, some of them are uh, some, of, uh, some of the worst stuff that we found in, in, in reviewing the books was uh, 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 in the teacher's manuals, methods as to how this material was to be used. One of the, uh, one of the uh, objections of pro-textbook people in this controversy has been, well, you're just uh, ignorant and uninformed, uh, speaking to anti-textbook persons and saying you don't understand the context in which this is to be used and it, 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 when, you, when you appreciate the context in which this is to be taught you will, uh, you'll have a fuller understanding of it. The context is more objectionable than the content uh, because the, we get into the methods and the way that the teacher's manuals advocate use of this uh, material is, uh, is very obviously the, the end result is, is the undermining of traditional values, of uh, morality, of common decency. Uh, there is direct, uh, vehement uh, uh, sacrilege, blasphemy against God, uh, uh, an attempt to, uh, to uh, ridicule and undermine the Christian faith and uh, to present Christianity in the light of mental illness. All of this to young people who are in their formative years, who are in the process of formulating their moral uh, values. And in other words, they don't have a set of values yet through which they can uh, uh, judge these things. This is the moral value system by which they will judge it, one that, one that uh, uh, is, uh, is critical of uh, what we've always considered traditional values. I think I should say for the record we're talking about here the books uh, uh, that uh, early in the controversy uh, early in the controversy uh, in order to uh, attempt to give the community a cooling off period well the Board of Education the Board of Education was uh, was attempting to buy time in the hope that this uh, very uh, vehement community protest against the books would uh, would die down. It now, as we look back in retrospect, it's obvious that their intent was not really to reach a solution, or to reach an understanding, or to accommodate themselves to community sentiment. Uh, that was the uh, that was the uh, rationale that they gave for appointing a textbook review committee. And they said, well, we'll have this review committee. And uh, I was one of 18 persons on the committee, uh, three of uh, three persons co uh, appointed by uh, board members, six board members. One of them was board member elect. And uh, 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 six of us on the uh, committee and one alternate member, seven altogether, withdrew from the uh, from the deliberations and, and proceedings of this committee when it became obvious that the, that the purpose that this committee uh, was intended that we should do was to, to put up a whitewash and it was hoped that within the 30 days that we were to, to do our job that things would cool off and uh, the board would proceed as they had uh, originally intended and when we, be, we began to see that this was uh, the only reason we withdrew and exercise the prerogative that was given to us in the beginning, which was that a minority report could be filed. Now, that's only the report that we filed. We had about two weeks. When we finally pulled out, we had a little more than two weeks' time. And yet the seven of us, we worked very late, we worked very hard, and we had some 250-some uh, books, 254 books. We were supposed to have had 325 books. Uh, so there are some 71 books we didn't ever get to, to review, and one can only question what uh, the reason for that is. But we had uh, 254 books between us, and uh, we reviewed them, 
and uh, we wrote up a 478-page report, which we submitted to the Board of Education. And this was our minority report, which, as it turned out, was the only real report of a review of the books. Uh, what the remainder of the committee did uh, was to submit a 15 or 17 page report which in a, which was a bland whitewash which in effect said uh, well we think these are beautiful we think they're wonderful and we think they're just fine and uh, they, they did not make a critical analysis of the books at all and I had understood that the 30 day uh, period was just a more or less uh, compromise on their part to yeah, this was the intention. Clearly the intention, as it turned out, it was uh, the turn of events uh, substantiated this. This was obviously what they were after to, to do. Well, as it turned out, of course, uh, things, uh, things became even more uh, controversial than before. Uh, these, uh, uh, this is typical of uh, people who are imbued with the arrogance of power. They are accustomed to sort of keeping a low silhouette when things warm up, and uh, generally speaking, people in public life have become accustomed to uh, uh, when the when the public becomes aroused about a certain thing, it's just ride out the storm. They they have come to learn that uh, public outrage has a way of subsiding with time, and they just figure, given enough time, this thing would go away. That was what they've been hoping for all along, and they still are. They're still hoping for this, and this is the thing that you mentioned here a few moments ago of the need to keep the issue alive. And one of the best ways, really, to, you can't just keep people whipped into a frenzy with, uh, with uh, rallies and parades. You know, you can't sustain a movement on that basis over the long range. But with a, uh, a, uh, a really dedicated program of private Christian education, you can not only keep the issue alive, but you can begin, you can make the beginnings of a real solution to the problem. And now where the issue will be sustained is not only in the establishment of private Christian education, and that must be done. And it must be done on as large a scale as we can, as time permits and as resources permit. That's one aspect of it. But what you're going to see, and I'm gonna predict a little bit, prophesy if you will, uh, a little bit and say where the issue is going to be uh, sustained is not just in the mere fact of establishing Christian schools and in turning out graduates that are uh, uh, of a higher quality academically socially psychologically morally in every way in every way that counts not only in the doing of those two things will the issue be sustained, but it will really be sustained and kept before the public eye because the real dedicated progressive educators and humanists know that they cannot allow us to succeed on a large scale in, 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 in private Christian education. They know that if private education is left unhindered to run its course and to grow and for more people to, in, in the public to seek this as an option to private education and for it to be successful, uh, they know that the obvious comparisons between the end results of these two kinds of education is going to be a disaster for them. And they don't dare let it happen. And they're going to use all of their uh, bureaucratic power, all of the influence that they have in their control of established institutions to prevent it, that they possibly can. Now, this is what you will see. I'm, I'm looking into the future now, and I'm making a clear prediction, and uh, they right now will say, if you want private schools, go on and have them, and they think that will go away too. They don't expect it to succeed. They expect that after a couple of years, the private education movement will founder or that it will be so small and insignificant that they can finally, after public attention dies away, come back around and harass the last remnants of it out of existence. Now, this is what they're counting on. This is what they're hoping for. And failing of this, there will be open warfare 
uh, in the courts, through legislation, on every possible front to, uh, to destroy and harass private Christian education uh, out of existence. Yeah, I, I'm satisfied. You can count on that. You, you'll see that happen in, in the next five years. Yeah. Just the fact that you know, the people in West Virginia were not going to quit. Yeah. They were just going to persist. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a matter, and, I, and, I, and, and, and as we have said, I don't think it's a matter of, uh, of uh, seeking or finding a solution through public education because public education is so cumbersome and unmanageable. It is not possible to provide the kind of education that everyone wants in a big monolithic system anymore. Uh, what you, you, in other words, what you have is the lowest common denominator of everybody's uh, desires and wishes, which is unacceptable to everyone. And uh, uh, the alternative uh, has to be some system of education that makes it possible for uh, all parents, whatever their, their personal opinions and feelings are, to have the kind of education that they want their children to have. I understand. I don't know if you're hurting about this or not. I understand the state of Mississippi did away with the compulsory attendance law in the public schools. I think I heard something about that, too. Now, that's another interesting point. That's another now, one of these. Is this possible that one state has done it, that other states can follow suit? I mean, you know, they've set a precedent in this. So, uh, yeah. Well, public edu public uh, compulsory school attendance is a matter of state law and everywhere, you see. Uh, and uh, certainly, if a state legislature uh, were to pass a law to that effect in, uh, in any state, then that would be the law. Uh, this brings to uh, the, uh, the asking of that question and the answer to it and all of the implications that are involved bring to mind uh, something that's, uh, that's very significant about this whole controversy, and that is that there are many things about education in America that we have simply taken for granted, that we have assumed are uh, untouchable, uh, immutable uh, uh, laws of nature almost. In other words, public, uh, public education being one and compulsory school attendance being one that uh, uh, and, and certification being one, you know, uh, academic certification that, uh, oh my goodness, if you have a school and it isn't certified, how terrible. Well, 45% of the public schools in West Virginia, public high schools, are not certified. A uh, few people know that. And, uh, that's gra interesting. Fact, yeah, right. And that's uh, 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 the graduates from these uncertified schools, unaccredited, I'm saying, un unaccredited. Unaccredited by the Northwestern Accrediting Association, North, North Central uh, Accrediting Association. Um, uh, the fact that the, these graduates are not from uh, accredited schools does not uh, prevent their enrollment in colleges and, 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 and other places. It isn't even questioned simply because they're from public schools. Uh, and even if they were questioned, uh, a youngster who can pass a college entrance examination can be enrolled in college if he can pass the examination, which is only right. This should be the criteria to determine eligibility for enrollment anyway. And so getting back to private, uh, getting back to uh, uh, compulsory school attendance, uh, uh, a free society as we uh, know it in our country today does seem to be uh, predicated to a considerable extent on the literacy of its citizens. And uh, for this reason, uh, we've had compulsory school laws, among other reasons, I suppose. Um, and, uh, but, but here's the problem that we have now. Uh, while compulsory school attendance and public education have, as institutions in our society, served us reasonably well, 
for the last 100 years. Now we're into a period of time when uh, the, uh, the disciples of progressive education and of humanism and of uh, philosophies that are totally alien to us, to the average American parent, have taken control of this very time-honored institution. And they have exploited it. They have exploited its good name, its reputation, its tradition. And uh, they're using the compulsory school attendance law as a legal mandate to make a captive audience of our youngsters for the propagation of a philosophy that is repugnant to us. Now that puts a very different slant on uh, where do we stand with regard to compulsory school attendance laws? Yeah, you know, it's just that I had heard this about Yeah, you know, well, I have heard that too. I, I don't know for certain that it is true. I have heard that it is, and uh, uh, the problems that that uh, are are the many many problems. Uh, that are everywhere across our country in public education are such that it isn't surprising to hear uh, that, and I think we will see more if not of this of this kind of thing of uh, that's a pretty desperate thing as we or as we have been conditioned to think about education and yet the other side of it is that the alternative which we're left with of, of going on and having compulsory education under the under existing circumstances are even more desperate uh, are even more dire and when you consider that uh, you, you the old saying the lesser of two evils uh, can sometimes be a hard choice but it isn't difficult for me as a parent to keep my youngster out of public school under existing circumstances as we have them no problem at all uh, because uh, I want him to uh, he, he's missed a year of school for all practical purposes uh, but uh, that's even in the, even at this time and in the light of all of it in in, in, in hindsight in, in retrospect uh, what I have done is far preferable to his remaining in public school under the uh, under the conditions that we have in Kanawha County Mine's five years old, but he'll be starting next year. And uh, I'm not going to put him in public school. No, I don't no way I can't with what I know about That's the, right. the system, you know. Uh, uh, we couldn't have known with conscience. That's right. It's a matter of conscience. It, when, you, when you know uh, that uh, here is a, a system where your teachers have been trained and who personally subscribe I'm not talking about not general I'm saying here yeah, there's a good teacher of course but, but, but generally speaking your typical public school teacher today <clears throat> has been indoctrinated in a philosophy of education that is secular uh, secular humanism or secularistic humanism that is atheistic that, uh, that uh, is hostile toward uh, Christianity and its basic moral tenets and uh, when you have a situation like this and you realize it and you understand that the public schools have become a forum for uh, programming and conditioning a generation of young people uh, in the same philosophy then uh, as a matter of conscience the choice you have no other choice than to keep your child out of a school system like this and seek uh, such other alternatives as may be available. Are we? Not quite.
Well, now to recap my, my viewpoint of this, and, and more and more people are coming to share this view, it's basically a philosophical uh, controversy. It's the difference between traditional education uh, as we have known it, and of course in the case of many of us, as we see our individual responsibilities as parents, uh, of uh, the responsibility to give our children a Christ-centered education, a Christian education, as opposed to uh, an atheistic, secularistic, humanistic, uh, progressive education type of academic program. And that has, uh, when we consider that uh, education in its totality as a program for young person, that not only includes the academic aspect, it includes the philosophical, it includes the social. Uh, the social environment in the average public school today is most unwholesome for a number of reasons. And this is, this is completely unacceptable to me too with, with all of its implications uh, for peer group pressure and influence and uh, the susceptibility of young people basically new about the problem because I've been a school teacher I was a teacher for six years I've been a teacher and principal and, and guidance counselor and uh, and have my graduate degree in education and I've been in adult education for uh, most of the time since I've been out of the teaching profession but uh, I mean it's out of the public school teaching profession anyway uh, but uh, Being on this textbook review committee, I was personally involved and I had this confrontation that I knew it would occur anytime anybody uh, uh, clearly uh, confronted uh, these, uh, this professionalist elite uh, group of educators. That's another thing I think it bears mentioning. That that uh, part of this problem is not only a philosophy, but that it is defended by uh, people. Now I'm speaking now about the professional educators, the humanists, the uh, the uh, the uh, the main philosophers of this particular approach to education. That they consider themselves as a professional elite as far as education is concerned. They consider themselves to be uh, uh, above the opinions uh, or, uh, uh, or desires of the parents of children. Uh, uh, they're very frank to say that they consider their own opinions the only enlightened ones as far as education goes. If you are merely a parent, or a taxpayer or a citizen in the community, it is not conceivable to them that you could have an enlightened opinion as to what your children ought to be taught, you see. They reserve the right to make all of the decisions as to what will be taught, curriculum content, and everything about education. And uh, at the beginning of the controversy, they stated that they still feel that way. They have, uh, in the course of the controversy, come to say what they would uh, uh, would uh, listen to parent input on an advisory basis, but solely on an advisory basis. And what that means, in essence, is they reserve the right for themselves to veto out completely anything that they don't want to accept by way of, uh, of, uh, of parental input. And so that's another aspect. That's another part of this philosophy. They consider themselves to be the, uh, the professional elite in the area of education to the exclusion of everyone else's opinions and 
uh, and they reserve this right as though they were, as though their pronouncements were immutable, as though their professional wisdom was infallible. Within a sense, they're putting themselves on a, on equal footing with God. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're, they're playing God as far as uh, education goes, and with our children. You see. I mean, who are you and I? We're just parents, you know. We just pay the bills. We just pay the bills and furnish the kids. And having done that, buzz off. Forget it. Yeah. Yeah, this is the uh, attitude I've got from some of my new parents back east uh, when I lived in Massachusetts that uh, had, you know, objectionable folks in the school there. Yeah. Uh, of course, they never got it to a point where they were on all wide scale protest, but you'd get a parent here and there that would go and protest. I remember one mother went to see the high school principal and he had the you know the unmitigated ball to come out and tell her where where your children are concerned as to what we teach you. Parents just don't have any rights. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, uh, that's right. That's the position that they take. I'm afraid if it me I would have took a poke at him. Well, this is the position that they take. They they uh, they claim this uh, they claim this right for themselves. It has no legal basis. It's just one of those things that, because of public neglect and apathy and indifference and then concern, uh, and it's because too of the public having a great trust and confidence in uh, public educators. For all these reasons combined, over the years this uh, arrogant attitude has evolved. They have simply never been questioned. They have been trusted. They, and they, during this controversy, they have said, trust us, trust us. Well, we have trusted them, and we have learned that they've betrayed our trust, and now we're concerned and upset, and we want someone to listen to us. And uh, so uh, uh, th that, that's how this has come about. It's just been a thing... When, when, when public education began in the middle of the 19th century, the Little Red Schoolhouse was a small uh, uh, institution in each community that was responsive to what parents wanted. And parents were personally acquainted with the teachers, and the teachers knew the families of all the youngsters. And it was possible uh, for education to be uh, responsive to what parents wanted. But... Uh, uh, with the passing of time, uh, public education has grown and become more and more anonymous, more bureaucratic, uh, 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 and uh, more impersonal. And today, uh, and, and of course there has in the process emerged this professionalist elite attitude, and uh, now the average parent doesn't know or probably never sees uh, the... Uh, the uh, uh, teacher of his children. Now, I wouldn't want to be quoted as saying that absolutely because you do see your, maybe you do see a, an interested parent will see his child's chi uh, uh, teacher uh, at PTA if he's interested enough to go once or twice a year, but you can't really get to know them. And uh, as a general rule, it is safe to assume that they subscribe to a philosophy that is unacceptable to us as parents. Thank you.